ان الحمد لله نحمده نستعينه نستغفره ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا ايها الذين امنوا ان جاءكم فاسق بنبا فتبينوا ان تصيبوا قوما بجهالة فتصبحوا على ما فتصبحوا تصبحوا على ما فعلتم نادمين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي امين يا رب so the subject of today uh, is the subject of understanding the lean from the perspective or from the tradition of hadith understanding the lean in the mirror of when a hadith is narrated someone says the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said such and such and such how do we understand this as a dalil how do we understand this as something that has a legislative uh, authority to it so there are a few rules for that for understanding hadith in general and then more specifically to understanding the hadith literature from the perspective of how may, how a hadith has hukum behind it so for example in the hadith literature we have on record today give and take about almost uh, you can say close to 100,000 sayings of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam Out of these hundred and thousand hadith, how many have legislative authority? Do you think they have a hukum behind it? For example, I'll give you an example. The Prophet said, "Sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Buniya Islam wa ala khamsin. Islam is built upon five things: shahada to an la ilaha illallah, wahdahu la sharika la, wa shahadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh." وإقام الصلاة وإيتاء الزكاة وصوم رمضان وحج البيت من استطاع إليه سبيلا أو كما قال صلى الله عليه وسلم Does this hadith for example make the five time prayers a hukum? Islam is built upon five things that you have shahada for Allah and His Messenger and you pray five times a day and you do hajj and you give two zakat and you do uh, you know uh, the fasting in the month of Ramadan This hadith is it have a hukum in it? Does it have a command in it? No. There's no command. It's a jumla khabriya. Ikhbar. Ikhbar. It's just information. There's no hukum. By this hadith, one cannot establish you have to pray five times a day. One cannot even establish from this hadith that praying is mandatory. From this hadith, you cannot establish that zakat is mandatory or hajj is mandatory or fasting is mandatory. Of course, they are mandatory. but for the proper reasons they're mandatory for the 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 hadith or the ayat that make it a hukum make it a hukum for example just because quran says something many times doesn't make make it legislative quran is always saying aqimus salah establish the prayers but that makes it mandatory wa atu zakat there's no hukum in atu zakat right remember this is an issue that came up in your house There's no hukum in Atu Zakah, is there? I agree with you, but a lot of people would disagree with right. you. Right. It would be Ita'i is zakat You have to give zakat. Zakat is mandated in another ayah of the Qur'an. That's a deeper discussion where there's hasr. There's hasr in that ayah. There's, there's command in that ayah. Something can come in the Qur'an a hundred times. It doesn't make it... Uh, mandatory to do it unless there is a reason to believe it has a command in the same way when the prophet says sallallahu alaihi wasallam for example i'falluha i'falluha let the beard grow i'falluha is a command but it's not a command it's an encouragement so how do you dis- like for example all the muhaddisin will and uh, not muhaddisin but all the fuqaha would agree the hadith in which the prophet said grow the beard It has it is a hadith of encouragement it is not a hadith of 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 amr in the sense of it is not tat'i 
It is not definite. It is not like salah, you have to do it. No. This is a very important subject because both in the Qur'an, the understanding of how you know something is, has legislative authority. And how you know in the hadith something has legislative authority. This is a very important and a very basic subject. So, first rule regarding hadith literature <coughs> is this. That the ahadith of the Prophet ﷺ, they have to be understood like, I'll give you this example, like a doctor when he's looking at the eye. When you're looking at the eye, you're not diagnosing anything else. You're only looking at the eye. Now the doctor will say, you need this medicine, this medicine, this medicine. That doesn't mean that's the only medicine he needs. He could need some other medicine for his leg, or for his stomach. But the doctor is only looking at his, his eye. The same thing because of the balagha, because of the eloquence of language. The way, and you know Quran also primarily. The Quran is primarily, primarily two languages. It is a language of literature and a language of law. Yes, okay. And especially the Makki Qur'an is more literary. And the Madani Qur'an is more, it has legal discourse. It is also literary, but it has legal discourse in it. So, and the basis of any civilization are these two things. Any civilization needs literary aspect, the cultural aspect, you can say. And it needs a legal aspect. Every civilization needs this. The point I'm trying to make is the Hadith literature, the Hadith literature is not literary primarily, nor is it based upon ahkam primarily. The Quran is primarily literary in its language and legal in its lang lang language. But the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, it is, you can say, it has the aslub, has the style of Bashara and Anzar. Yeah, there is uh, a hadith book that has a very good wordings. Uh, even if you look at the hadith books, like for example, Riyad uh, al-Salihin, uh, Bashara, the idea of Bashara, right? The, the garden of the righteous, right? The Prophet ﷺ, his wordings were to create a certain culture, a certain atmosphere, a level of ihsan, you know, uh, when you meet your brother, meet him with a happy face, right? Uh, so on and so forth. So, the Hadith literature is very eloquent, for sure. Very eloquent, as, as, as you will see, in, because part of this has to do with eloquence. But the Hadith literature is not primarily literary, nor is the Hadith literature primarily legal. But it is, you can say, the Asloob of Bishar and Anzar. There is a hadith book, I'm forgetting, the same thing, kitab, like uh, the kitab, Mishkat al Masabih, the light, right? You have, uh, so, so, uh, there's another uh, uh, hadith book, it is very precise in actually the approach of Quran, I mean the approach of the sayings of the Prophet ﷺ. It is, uh, it's like something like uh, warning and bishara, but it doesn't use these words, ta'adir, uh, uh, the, uh, huh? uh, that's not the book. Okay, anyway, there is a book that very precisely captures this idea that the sunnah of the Prophet, the hadith of the Prophet, is mostly to encourage people to go in one direction and stay away from the other direction. It is the asloob of, you can say, anzar, warning the people, don't do this. And, uh, and uh, I think the word is targheeb is in there. It has two words. Huh? No, no, no. Uh, anyway, so the asloob of Quran is legal and literary. The asloob of hadith is of encouragement or discouragement, you can say. Uh, bishara, tabshir, and anzar, or inzar. Okay, when you're looking at someone's body, you're only looking at their. Aye. So, for example, the Prophet, when he said, Man qala la ilaha illallah, al jannah. Whoever says la ilaha illallah, he'll enter Jannah. 
The Prophet's only looking at that one action. Whoever says, La ilaha illallah, he's going to enter Jannah. This is not talking about any of the other, because if the Prophet gave you all the exceptions, it would take away from the literary merit. The balagha would go away. Right? If the Prophet, for example, when the Prophet says, Wallahi la yu'min, or La yu'minu ahadakum, hatta yuhibbu li akhihi ma yuhibbu li nafsi. Right? None of you is a true believer. The Prophet's only looking at one aspect. La yusriku, La yusriku hina, yusriku sarik, wa huwa mu'minun, wa la yazni, zani hina, 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 yuzni. So a, a, a person doesn't do adultery while he's in the state of doing adultery while he's a mu'min. He's only looking at... So you can't use one hadith to make... Like if you see someone do something against a hadith and the Prophet has some discouraging words, this is how it should be looked at. Hadith literature should be looked at, discouraging words or encouraging words. You cannot derive hukam from them unless... There is a reason, clear reason to derive a legislative authority from them. So, uh, in general, uh, of course, ما أتاكم الرسول فخذوه Whatever the messenger gives you, you take. وما نهاكم فانتهوا But here notice, the asloob of this ayah is ما أتاكم is not, is, There's no hukum in here either, in this ayah. There's actually an encouragement in this ayah. Because it would be with Lam Nahi or Fail al Amr or some other word that says you have to take everything the Prophet said. No. Of course, Atiullah wa Atiur Rasul, that is when there is a command. Atiullah wa Atiur Rasul is when there is a command, when there is a command from Allah and His Messenger, you have to obey. So this is clear. When Allah and His Messenger give a command, you have to obey. But out of the 100,000 hadith literature we have or so, only the agreed upon number of hadith that have ihkam in them is 1,200 to 1,300. Okay? The agreed upon number of the ahadith that have hukam in that, there's qat'i hukam in this hadith, are how many? One thousand. It's a big number, by the way. Don't think a thousand. I don't know how many people here think, think a thousand hadiths is easy to memorize. <laughs> a thousand, three hundred of different aspects of your life is a very large number. But the agreed upon, for example, uh, Imam Ibn Hajj, uh, he in his very famous book, which is well known and well published in the Muslim world, uh, uh, the uh, Reaching the Objective. And the goals. This is a famous book of Imam al-Hajjah that's translated. And he is my favorite muhaddith, by the way. Uh, his works are like very, very incredible. <coughs> so, uh, uh, Imam al-Hajjah uh, in his book, Balagat al-Maram, which is a book on the ahkam of tahara, salah, and so on, all the different hadud and the ahkam of, uh, you know, the business, and all of, the, all of them, he's collected them, around 1,200 in his book. Okay. Yes. Okay. Sahib al Fatul al Bari. Rahmatullah alayhi. Okay. So, the aslu, the style of hadith literature is what? Hmm? Encouraging or? Discouraging. Discouraging. Okay. This is the aslu of the sayings of the Prophet. Now, when the Prophet's looking at one aspect, he's only looking at that aspect. He's not looking at the rest. So, for example, the Prophet ﷺ, he says, uh, whoever prayed uh, salah 40, uh, 40 days or 40 prayers in Medina, he will be in paradise, for example. So this is only looking, this action, this action alone is enough to get him into Jannah. But it's not looking at any of his other aspects. This is why you cannot base a hukum upon it, because a hukum is not based upon one aspect of anything. When you're giving a hukum, you have to look at many aspects of something. So, for example, uh, so okay, so understand the the prophet is talking like a prescription, like a doctor gives a prescription, right? So when he, a doctor is giving a prescription, he's only looking at that particular disease. And he's saying something only for that particular disease. Get it? Okay. So, uh, this is the first point. 
Second is, uh, I'm going to now talk about a subject that's related to this issue. <coughs> and that is the role of aql in understanding hadith. This is very important. The role of aql. Because first of all, uh, anytime you read something, you're understanding it with your aql. The text is not telling you something, your aql is telling you what the text is saying. The text is not talking to you. Your aql is telling you what the text is saying. Your mind, you two people may read the same saying of the Prophet and come to two different conclusions. So who is talking? Not the hadith is not talking. The aql is talking. Right? The aql is in giving an interpretation of this is what the Prophet is saying some lies. Now, and this is very important because our general approach to hadith literature has to be, has always been, but not in recent times. Any time we hear a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, because the Prophet, our hadith, uh, you can say, attitude towards hadith has to be, the hadith has to prove itself to us. Not that we believe in the hadith blanket. We don't believe in the sayings of the pro in, in something called the hadith without like a blank check. There's no blank check for the hadith literature. There's no blank check. And the ulama of, uh, have in fact one of the strongest hadith that's in both Bukhari and Muslim repeated many, many, and this is one of the most authentic hadith in all of hadith literature, meaning it has come from so many turks, so many directions this hadith has come that it's true. Uh, that is the Prophet said, whoever says something on me, I have not said it, he's going to make a place for himself in the hellfire. So just giving all the hadith literature a blank check that the Prophet, because we, you know, we feel hadith is sacred, so we give it a blank check, we should not do this. Hadith has to prove itself, even to the point, I will give you an, an example, from the time of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ibn Abbas radiallahu an was told, by Abu Hurairah radiallahu an. This is in the book of Imam Ibn Majah. Uh, Abu Hurairah radiallahu an says to Ibn Abbas that the Prophet did wudu after eating camel meat. Okay. As you know, there are some ahadiths that the Prophet did wudu after eating camel meat. Okay. So Abu Hurairah told this to who? Ibn Abbas. Now, he's narrating what? An event that was from the Prophet ﷺ. What is Ibn Abbas's answer to Abu Hurairah? He said, this doesn't make sense. He says, this doesn't make, doesn't make sense. Why am I pointing this out? On the one hand, and you know this, had, had, this surah is very interesting from both of these, you can say, extreme sides. One is, O oh, you people who believe, do not raise your voices on, above the voice of the Prophet. So if someone says something, and he says, Rasulullah said this, don't argue at that time. But as far as accepting it is concerned, the ulama that take this ayah, uh, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِنْ جَاءَكُمْ فَاسِقٌ بِنَبَأٍ فَتَبَيَّنُوا When some fasik will come to you with some news and the, ex and the expectation is, this is why. Why is the Qur'an assuming he's a fasik? See, the Qur'an is assuming he's a fasik. If a fasik comes to you with something, why? Because when you don't know the person, you don't know the person personally, and some news is coming to you from somebody you don't know, you have to approach it from a negative perspective. So on the one side, لا ترفعوا أسواتكم فوق صوت النبي Don't say, oh, this is not hadith, this doesn't make sense, and oh, what are you saying, Rasulullah would have never said this. No, this is wrong. But on the other hand, to, you cannot just, as far as respect and other and honor 
and uh, etiquettes are concerned, if someone says the Prophet said something, لا ترفع صوت صوتكم أصواتكم فوق صوت النبي. But as far as accepting it is concerned, as far as giving giving it authority is concerned, you have to treat it as with doubt until the hadith will prove itself to you. Let me give you an example, a very good example of sometimes. This is a famous narration of Sahih Bukhari. Where does this hadith come from? Sahih Bukhari. This is a Sahih narration from, from Sahih Bukhari. Now, this is what the difference between the fuqaha and the muhaddithin is. The hadith in Sahih Bukhari, which everyone knows. But now I will tell you what some of the usuliyin and the fuqaha they say about this hadith. This hadith is where? Sahih Bukhari. Which chapter? Qasasul Anbiya. Okay? The hadith is that Malak al Maut and Jibra'il came to Musa. Musa punched the angel of death. Do you remember this? Do you remember the story? Okay. And so he goes to Allah and then he comes back and he put, put your hand over this. What about the ayah? فَإِذَا جَاءَ أَجَلُهَا لَا لَا يُوَخَّرْ When the hour comes, it does not get huh? delayed. Right? When the hour of death comes, it does not get delayed. Now you have a Sayyid Hadith here in Sayyid Bukhari. The book that many people say is the most authentic book after the Book of Allah. Here's a story that the, 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 uh, the moment of death for Musa got delayed. And here's an ayah of the Quran that says, death is never, never delayed. So the point is, that from the perspective of the Asuliyin and from the perspective of the Fuqaha, they would say this hadith cannot be accepted. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what He said is, is haq and what He said is clear, and any hadith, any narration that comes in its place cannot be accepted. Now, a muhaddith would say, but the chain is strong. Huh? The muhaddith would say, because you have to understand how a muhaddith thinks. You have to understand how a faqih thinks. They think differently. You know, they, they come from two different worlds. And so, simply saying the Prophet ﷺ said something is not acceptable in itself. It has to what? Prove itself. Now, I'm not saying if this hadith is right or wrong. I'm just giving you a different perspective of how different people will look at the same issue Right? And not accept it. And other people will may look at it and say, okay, well, it's a saying like this, we have to accept it. So. Can I, can I just say one thing? Yes. And the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there's another hadith that says, istafti qalbaka. Yes, I'm and coming to that. Come. And this is extremely important yes. as far as the explanation of what you are talking yes. about. Yes. So, so the role of aql, see, is something very important and one of the things that's interrelated with the role of aql is something Quran calls over and over again ma'roof. What is ma'roof? Huh? What is ma'roof? Established. What is established? What is well known? What is in the human fitrah? Right? What you know by human nature. If there is a hadith that goes against ma'roof, that goes against, forget about Quran for a second, that's clear. But even if there is a hadith that goes against what is huh? known, and known and established in part of human fitrah, and there's a hadith that goes against that, which way will you go? Imam Abu Hanifa says, I will go with Aql. Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal says, I will go with the hadith. In this case, if there's a clash between Aql and hadith, Abu Hanifa says, I will go with Aql. Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal says, I will go with the weak hadith. So the point is that we sometimes downplay the role of, oh, you're talking your opinion, you know, you're, you're using your mind. What do you mean? This is the biggest gift Allah gave. This is the biggest gift Allah gave. You use this on the Quran. You use this on the sunnah of the Prophet and so, when something doesn't make sense, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. And, and another thing, 
that, you know, whether, and, and, and uh, there's so much to say on this subject, by the way, but I want to give you an example. Uh, there's a hadith of the Prophet وسلم, and I want to tie this in together with many issues. Uh, there's a hadith of the Prophet وسلم, that uh, we mentioned last week, that a man, he didn't have money, so the Prophet, he was married, the Prophet told him to get married again. Remember this hadith, we were discussing this, and the Prophet then told him get married again, and then again, and then finally he became rich. Does this fit within ma'roof? Huh? No. Not only that, this is another rule now. Now watch this rule. If there is a saying of the Prophet ﷺ, but there is a more broader and a general rule that contradicts that, you don't accept the one that is a subcategory of a broader hadith. For example, لا ضرر ولا ضرار. This is in Islamic law, by the way. This is the single most important hadith in Islamic law. In Islamic law, this is the most important hadith. Most important, most significant. Because, you see, in Western law, the most important thing, the most important principle in law, when you're looking at a situation, the most important principle in law is that in Western law, they look for personal freedom, personal rights. This is the question. Whose rights are being what? Invaded. Whose rights are being what? Invaded. Invaded. This is the question. In Islam, the most basic question is, لا ضرر ولا ضرر. Who is causing the harm? And what is causing the harm? How is this different? I'll give you an example from this illustration that I'm about to give. There's a man, he has a building. On the second floor, he has a window. Okay? Now follow this whole illustration. I know I've said this before, right? But I'm going to explain it more with this principle in mind today. So there is this building. It has a window on the second floor. <coughs> Another man comes, he builds a house. And he puts a window on his second floor facing into his window. The neighbor doesn't like it, he goes to the, to the judge in America, says, this man, he's put a window on his, on, his, on his building, it's looking into the privacy of my daughter's room, I don't like it. The judge is going to say what? That's his right. That's his right. If you don't like it, close your window. The Muslim, now if you go to the Qadi, the Qadi will say, the question is, not whose right is what, if you go from the perspective of whose right is what, you'll say, well, this is his building, it is his right. This is his building, this is his right. I don't want to interfere in his rights. I don't want to interfere in his rights. So he has to, he, if he doesn't like his windows looking in, he can close his window. The Qadi will see who is causing the harm. And the Qadi will tell the man who built that window looking into that house, you have to remove that window from here and you can have it on any other side of your house. Now, second issue. There is a well. In this, this house now also has a well. And under this well is the water. Everybody is taking it. Now, he builds a well. And his well is taking his water. Now, they go to the court in America. And this, the, 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 this plaintiff goes again. And he says, you know, he's taking my water. And can you please stop him from having this well? The, uh, the judge in America will say, well, it's his property, it's his water, he has the right to it, you cannot take from this <coughs> water. You go to the Sharia court, and you present the case, the Qadi is going to ask what? what? What is the harm? There's no harm. No one's being hurt by this well that's here. It's being shared by everybody. If there is no harm, this is the question, maybe in some cases there can be a harm. Because if there's less water or something like this, but if there's a lot of water, like you know in the villages in Pakistan and stuff, you, everybody's using that, the whole village, right? If the, if the judge sees it, there's no harm, he's going to say, no, he can have his well, and he's taking, the water is for everyone. The general principle also for water is that water is for everyone. So, the hadith literature, when we say hadith, we always look at the broader principles, 
and the broader principle, these the the subcategories of anything have to align with the principles of the broader categories. If they do not align with the broader categories, they cannot be accepted. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقُولُوا لِلنَّاسِ husna," And say good things to people. And the Qur'an also says, لَا جَهْرَ بِالسُوءِ إِلَّا مَنْ You can't say bad things to people unless you have been wronged in some way. Somebody's hurt you, so then you say something bad that's allowed. But now when the Qur'an says, قُولُوا لِلنَّاسِ husna," Okay, say good things to people. Does that give someone who has authority, like a cop for example, or some other person authority to be mean? No, it doesn't. Just because he has authority doesn't mean he can be meanful, right? So, the, the broader categories have more influence on the subcategories. Not the subcategories having more influence on the broader categories. This is very important when we are studying hadith. Hadith like, إِنَّمَا الْعَمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ لا الدين النسيحة الخمر الخمر شر شر الخبائث or أم الخبائث or you know these ahadith of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم that established the main frame of the yes you just want to say another hadith that relates to all of this for the general good the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said Yes. And he did not specify only Muslims. He said that nas, right. nas So these these like this hadith, you know, follow the bad deed with the good deed, and this is general principles, right? They encompass the whole of the deed. So there's some sayings of the Prophet, they encompass the whole of Islam. And that is the significance of, the, of like hadith of like uh, uh, hadith of Jibra'il, hadith of Jibra'il when Jibra'il alayhi salatu wasalam came. So anyway, coming back to the hadith literature, on the one side, لا ترفعوا لا ترفعوا صوتكم أصواتكم فوق صوت النبي. When someone says the Prophet said something, don't need to say anything back to him because of not him, but because of the honor of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. But on the other hand. Something has to really prove itself to be a sahih saying of the Prophet ﷺ. So this is one point. Second point is that uh, <clears throat> when you are studying the Hadith literature, uh, what is what happens? What do you accept as a dalil? In other words, a Hadith of the Prophet saying something. And a Sahabi, a companion of the Prophet, or many companions of the Prophet doing something different, which would be stronger for you? So this, there would be some difference of opinion on this issue. Some people will go with what the Prophet said. Some people will go with what his his Sahaba, his Sahaba did. The ijma of the Sahaba. In fact, in the Sharia, as understood by the ulama, is alaykum sunnati wa sunnatul khulafa al rashidin al mahdiyin. From this. Uh, the ijma of the, because when we say the khulafa, when we say the khulafa, we don't mean only Abu Bakr or we don't only mean Umar, we mean the ijma of the Sahaba. Because the, the and inshallah, one day if I ever have time, uh, I will give a lecture series on the, the fiqh of Abu Bakr and the fiqh of Umar and how they differed from each other, their, their method of fiqh and the fiqh of Uthman and Ali, how they differed from each other because they were vastly different in how their approach to Islamic law, their approach to Islamic law was vastly different from one another, very different. I mean, I mean, I don't want to go into it, but uh, you know, Umar, Umar was uh, very, uh, you can say, uh, he was very flexible in how he looked at the Sharia. He looked at what we can say the maqasid of the Sharia, the intent of the Sharia. He was very open, whereas Abu Bakr wanted to do everything only the way the Prophet did it. You know, even like when Umar said, preserve the Qur'an, for example, Abu Bakr didn't want to do it until qalbi, until something entered his heart. Abu Bakr said, something entered my heart that gave me this conviction, I should do this. Otherwise, Abu Bakr was never going to put Qur'an in the form of the book. Because it was against his personality actually to do that. 
You know, Abu Bakr is that person that he, you know, was uh, everything the Prophet started in his lifetime, he didn't want to stop the armies going against the Roman Empire. And, you know, this was Abu Bakr. This was his personality. He's, I'm, you know, and some people say the best followers sometimes make the best leaders. But Umar was completely different. He was doing ijtihad against the Prophet in the time of the Prophet. Yes. Yes. And most of the time, uh, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa agreed with Sayyidina Umar. Yes. And when, when uh, Rasulullah didn't agree with him, sometimes Allah agreed with him. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so he was doing ijtihad, his, his own ijtihad. In the time of the Prophet, when the net messenger, the Prophet is there and he's doing his own issue. Can I just say one yes. thing? I'm sorry to interrupt yes, you. Yes. No, and this, this shows the importance of al aql Yes. This is extremely important. And the gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to understand his book is your aql So, the, uh, the other way, so one is aql, the other is ma'roof, the other is maslaha and mafsada. Now, I gave you the basic uh, principle. When you're looking at any event, the most basic hadith is any qadi who doesn't know this principle, he cannot be a qadi. Because the basic principle of being a qadi is the basic mainframe that from which he has to answer his fatwa is who is causing the harm. For Western law, it is personal freedom and personal rights. It's my water, it's my property, I can do anything. No, no, no. What matters is who is causing the harm in Islam. Okay, so this leads to very vast understanding of law, you know, when you look at it from these two different perspectives. And so the, uh, when we're looking at any hadith that, for example, any hadith, now here's a hadith that we were just discussing last week. For example, the Prophet said, get married and get married and get married and finally you will marry somebody who a lady brings in a lot of risk. Now, is there darar in this this idea? Is there harm in this idea? The other ladies didn't bring the risk. This lady, she brought the... Because, look, you're a qadi or you're a Muslim. You're going to advise your brother. He's already, he doesn't have enough money to ha handle one wife. You're going to tell him to get married to a second wife? And then on top of that, a third wife? No, no one would, uh, no one would do this. So if the Prophet did this, as this is the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, this will be considered something specific to that, that companion of the Prophet ﷺ. That was specific to them, if it's a same hadith, but it cannot be applied in general, because the broader ahadith do not agree with such an attitude. Do you get what I'm trying to say? Because we will look at, do not cause harm. You're telling the brother to get married again, you're causing harm. We will never want to put our brother in a harm's way. And the Prophet, as far as I think of the Prophet, the Prophet would never put, never ask somebody to do something that would cause him harm and then cause him more harm and then finally there, there's something. No, and this, so even a lot of it has to do with our uh, misinterpretation uh, when you don't keep these principles in mind. So, for example, the hadith that's in Sahih Bukhari, all of you have heard of this hadith where Ibrahim came to the house and Ismail had gone hunting and he talked to his wife and you know he divorced his wife and then some people also took that hadith to say, see, he was poor and then he married this other girl, she, he became well-to-do, so the girl she brings her risk. Well, both of them bring their risk, not one's bringing their risk, they're both bringing their risk. The real thing was, is that the first wife was not pious. The second wife was pious. She was, uh, she had more piety. Uh, so that's the real issue, not the issue of that this wife will bring in more, uh, uh, more risk or something like this. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, and in your sky, in this, in, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is your risk. So the, this, the, the other question is, okay, so you have a Sahabi doing something versus a saying of the Prophet Of course, you have the famous debate between Imam Shafi and Imam Abu Hanifa, in which Imam Abu Hanifa looks, when he looks at fiqah, he looks at what the Prophet did, not what he said. Meaning, in, in Canada, if there are two ahadith, and one is saying the Prophet did this, 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 
In another hadith, the Prophet said this, this, this. Abu Hanifa will choose what he, what he did, his actions. What his actions are more important. Imam Shafi'i will say, no, what he said is more important. And uh, so, so anyway, there's. Uh, but if you had to do tarjih, if you had to choose between the two, Imam Abu Hanifa would go with one. The, uh, uh, Imam, uh, Imam Shafi'i would go with the other. The point I'm trying to make here is that. So one is what a Sahabi said or what a Sahabi did versus a Hadith. Second is, what do you do when an entire city of Muslims is doing one thing and a Hadith is saying something else? For example, the people in Medina, they do something and a Hadith that Sahih is saying something else. Where do you go? The A'mal, the A'mal in Medina, the people of Medina are doing one thing and the Prophet said something else. Where do you go? So the Dalil is not only Quran and Sunnah, is what I'm trying to say. Dalil Quran is Qatri. In the Quran, it, the only argument with Quran is what is it really trying to say. And the ihkam in Quran are well known. If, the, if it's in Fair al-Amr or Kutiba alaykum al siyam and so on and so forth, this is a separate subject. But Dalil, as far as Hadith is concerned, Hadith has to go, the Hadith has to pass not only the test of Qur'an, it has to pass an internal test where the broader ahadith align with the subtopic, and it also has to pass the test of of ma'aruf, of aql, maslaha and mafsada. Maslaha is basically that is there benefit or is there fasad in this, in this issue, by this idea. So you cannot understand, and this is what's very important, you can never understand a hadith that leads to some sort of mafsada. That's not possible. Because Islam stands against everything that would do that. So for example, where the Prophet ﷺ said women are naqisul, naqisul aql. You can't understand it in the context except that the broader hadith fit into it. Your interpretation has to be aligned with the broader so for example, then it becomes important that the Prophet gave this as a khutbah on the day of their Eid, specifically to the women, and so on and so forth. And then from there we can discuss the psychology and different aspects. But this is not to demean uh, women, uh, as some of the ulama, traditional ulama that I have met, I was, they will clearly tell you, women are less than men. I've heard this many times. And in fact, when I was in Azhar, I had a debate with one brother, he said, uh, you know, I said, well, uh, you know, al-ilm uh, faridatun ala kullu muslimin wa muslimat. And he said, see, the Prophet said muslimat after muslimin. And so, this type of, uh, uh, I mean, just in Arabic language, that's just how it works. It wouldn't sound good if you said muslimat and then muslimin, <laughs> you know. So, anyway. So, then, so you have ma'aruf, you have aql, you have the broader ahadith. Is this issue going to cause harm? Is it going against Quran? There's maslaha and mafsada. And then finally, there is the issue of history itself. There's the issue of historical precedents. Because you see, hadith literature, for example, I'll give you one very good example. If you look at history, if you look at what? Historical accounts versus hadith. If you look at the hadith, you will may reach the conclusion Aisha radiallahu anha was seven years old when she married the Prophet. If you look at historical accounts, you will reach the conclusion she was in her 18, 19, 20 during that, during that time period. So when we say, this is why you have to understand that hadith is a great masterpiece, intellectual inheritance, intellectual masterpiece. It is, it is phenomenal in what it has done in terms of collecting the sayings of the Prophet But we must understand that hadith is a human created product. And hadith has to go through many filters. The filter of Quran, the filter of your aql, the filter of it, the principles of Islamic law, the principles, it has, to, it has to align itself even with history. So, it becomes very easy, for example, when you, uh, you know, my opinion is, for example, Aisha, the Allah, and I was not seven years old. 
when she married the Prophet. I don't believe this because it's embarrassing as a Muslim if, if I believe that. I don't have a problem with that. Wallahi, I don't. But I actually believe that. I believe she was not seven. I believe she was probably 18 or 19 years old. And so, But the, if you look at history, that's what history tells you. By the way, Aisha herself says, I was a jariha. Jariha means a lady in her teens when I married the Prophet. This is her own words about herself. I was a teenager when I married the Prophet So anyway, uh, so then, you know, there is the maqasid of sharia. Maqasid of sharia, you know how many maqasid of sharia there are? Maqasid of sharia, the intent of the sharia, what sharia wants. What does sharia want to accomplish? There are five maqasids of sharia. Number one, aql itself. To preserve the aql. In fact, let me put it to you this way. This will make it very interesting. Something is haram because something is haram. When we say masjid haram, what does it mean? The masjid that is sacred. Something is haram because something is haram. Something is forbidden because something is sacred. Nothing is forbidden for no reason. Everything is haram because something is haram. The sharia wants to protect the aql, so all things that will affect the aql negatively become, like drugs, alcohol, at that level, they all become haram. This is not a lecture in Qiyas where how do you say from alcohol to drugs, but, uh, but all things... So there are five, you can say, muharramat, uh, five sacred things. And the sharia is there to protect those five sacred things. They're the higher intent of the sharia. I'll give you an example. Aql is one, life is the next. Doesn't matter, Muslim, non-Muslim, life is sacred. So qatl is haram, life is also haram, muharram. Life is sacred, so therefore killing is forbidden. The word haram means sacred, and the word haram also means forbidden. So, aql, life. Now, I'll give you an example. See, this is where you have to keep the entire sharia, the broad view of the sharia in front of you. For example, in Saudi Arabia, there was a school, I don't know how many of you heard about this event, there was a school, the Kuliyat al-Banat or some, something like this. Uh, the college of the girls, it got on fire. The firemen came to put out the fire. The shurta, you know the shurta of Amr bin Maruf, Nayyad al munkar the, the police uh, for enjoining good for bidi, well, they came. And they told the firemen, you can't go inside. Why? Because women don't have their hijab. How many girls died? 200 girls died. 200 girls died, and this is, now the whole world was talking about this is Islam. No, the maqab, you have to understand things are in their priorities. There are certain higher goals of Sharia. Protecting life is the biggest goal, amongst the biggest goals of Sharia. When the Prophet said on the Hajjat al Wida, you know, what day is this? What month is this? Which place is this? He said, Today, your lives and your property and your honor are sacred. Haram, that's sacred. This is what the this is what the Sharia wanted. The highest intent of the Sharia is life becomes sacred, the wealth of the people becomes sacred, their honor becomes sacred, so on and so forth. There are five of them. I will come to that. But this is the purpose of the Sharia: is to protect this. If you take like something of hadith or some aspect of Islam and you don't have the broader perspective, you're going to lose the intent of the Sharia, the purpose of Sharia. So aql. Uh, haya, man, deen, deen, as far as deen is concerned, it, Muslims are to protect the synagogues and the churches of even the Christians. We are to help the Christians maintain their deen. 
and nasab, meaning your lineage. Your lineage is your right, your aql is your right, your haya, your deen, and uh, honor. No, 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 because the, the honor issue is, is, uh, is not amongst the five top. Even though that hadith, of course, the Prophet said it. But in that, that comes with aql and, and haya and some of the, uh, it's their tangents. Of course, a person's honor is sacred in Islam. Don't get me wrong. But amongst, it's amongst the top ten. The, the honor is amongst the top ten. But amongst the top five is your aql, your life, your deen, your mal, and your nasab. Honor and deen. So the point is, the sharia has levels. So when you look at an issue, it's not just a matter of this or that. Hadith, literature, you know, Quran is qat'i. There's no issue about the Quran. But when it comes to hadith, there is an issue of priorities. There's an issue of how to look at the hadith relating it to today. So, so there is... Uh, <coughs> huh? Time is khatam again. So inshallah, I will end here. Inshallah, if you can turn that off, inshallah, then we will uh, continue next week. So uh, we will talk about...